How dare you? I was working in all these sexy industries. Like, why would I work in credit card processing? That is horrible. I want to get into the weeds a little bit and talk about that journey. As she takes a sip of drink. Yeah, you better. Hey, it's time to drink. And three months later, I lost my job. I was terrified, and I thought, well, this is real life, and I'm a grown-up now. Anyone that says they did it all by themselves is that damn lie. Also, I wouldn't trust that person. Man, like, don't. What? Yes. Why? <laughs> yes. Don't trust them. Then it was a matter of me saying, I'm good enough, and I believe in myself enough that if I get this opportunity that I'm not going to squander it, and I'm not going to screw it up. Screw it up. Screw it up. Screw it up. Like up, like up. Welcome back to Business and Bourbon, where we have real talk with real people. I'm the creator of Business and Bourbon and your host, Ronnell Richards. I want you to imagine something. Imagine you got laid off, not once, not twice, but three times. And after that third layoff, you decided, hey, I'm gonna take my life and take my well-being into my own hands. And you decide to start a business. Years later, you're wildly successful in traveling the country and you are working with the likes of Deepak Chopra, Shaquille O'Neal, Jillian Michaels, Sounds like the perfect entrepreneur porn story, right? Well, that's Dara Brewstein's story. And so I invited Dara into the bar today to share her story. But let me tell you something. It ain't that simple. As you guys know, and you've come to expect from Business and Bourbon, it's far more complicated than that. And we're going to get really deep into what her challenges have been and what her journey's been. So with that said, I want you to grab your glass, grab your cup, grab your favorite drinking receptacle, pour in your favorite beverage, sit down next to us at the bar, and enjoy a little business in bourbon. All right, welcome back to Business and Bourbon. As always, I'm your host, Ron L. Richards, and I am here in, again, beautiful downtown Atlanta. I think maybe I need a job. I think the Atlanta Tourism Board needs to hire me because whenever we're doing this podcast, it's just beautiful out here. Um, if you guys have the opportunity to, to get to Atlanta in the spring, you'll see what I'm talking about. Except for the pollen. Pollen sucks. Um, <laughs> with all that said, hey, I have a really, really special guest. And, and she has just a ton of accomplishments. And when you guys Google her, you, you'll see. Like, it just keeps going and on and on, page and page and page. But um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. But what that really tells me is this, this is someone that we can really learn from. Um, and in a way that we can only do at Business and Bourbon. You guys know how we do. So with that said, no further ado, I've got Dara. Don't call me Dara. <laughs> Brewstein here. <laughs> That's right. What's, what's up, everybody? <laughs> what's up, Dara? You all right? I'm great, especially with this Prosecco. Yeah, so that's how we always started off. We want to talk about what we're drinking, and you are drinking... Prosecco, straight up Italy. It's a language I speak, a people I love. Do you really? Yeah, see. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Um, I have what they're calling a French Creole. So it has some bourbon in it. It's got some um, cognac in it and some other good stuff, and it's really tasty. Um, my boy Eric here hooked it up. If you come down to King & Duke, come see Eric. He's amazing, but they're all amazing. Is this your first time here? No, it's not, but I made it really easy on Eric with a solid straight pour. You, you really <laughs> did. <You know? laughs> well, hey. Let's go ahead and give the, the audience just a little bit of context, okay? You are, I've already said, oh, you're, you're super successful. But, you know, everyone that gets on the show, we know that they have success. Um, but that's not really what it's all about for us. That's not the reason that we're here. We're here to coach. We're here to teach. We're here to share so that we can all grow as a tribe. But all that said, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. All right. So I'll do a quick Cliff's Notes version because this like. is going to be uber embarrassing. So. <laughs> So here's the quick rundown. Uh, for the last 10 years, my twin brother and I have founded and owned a credit card processing business, which we have grown into 38 states. But what I really want to get to at some point is the trials and tribulations that it took oh, to Oh, we're going to get that. there. Yeah, yeah, like the tears on the bathroom floor, quite literally. Uh, after that, about two years in, so eight years ago, I started by accident a company called Network Under 40 to help fr my friends initially make friends after college. And now it's the place to go in mid-tier U.S. cities to build friendships and business collaborations with people who are your peers. And during that same time, our market fell apart. And I thought, hey, why don't I write a children's book, which I did on financial literacy education for six to nine-year-olds. And most recently, I have been taking everything I've learned over the past 10 years and 
because I've been fortunate to have the time and financial freedom to do so, have begun to share a lot of free resources on how to intentionally design your life and define success for yourself, how to build a business to fund said life, not consume it, and how to build a network to support you and your dreams. Love it. Wow. Okay. One thing that I heard there that I want you to address, okay, your business partner is your twin brother. Yeah, if you can share a womb, you can share a business. <laughs> you can, I like that. Tweet. <laughs> so um, a lot of people, I've given a, given a lot of, of advice out there. People ask me about going into business with family and whether it's a good idea or bad idea. Um, my younger brother worked with me and for me for many years. Um, it's hard right yep. i think my our my dynamic was very it was different right so it, it really worked well for us but you know what i tell folks is that you need to be concerned about the relationship at the end of the day i mean there's no business that's more important than your relationship with your sibling with your with anyone mother your father your cousin so how the hell did you guys make that work well it's interesting hilariously we've never been close friends and we still remain to this day not close friends, but we make excellent business partners. And the reason is simply, I, actually I accredit it to two things. One is just like the nature nurture conversation, but he is entirely opposite of me in every way, shape and form. His personality, his strengths, his skills, his demeanor, every which way he is the opposite. And we are very complimentary that way. He is your prototypical COO guy. Yeah. And I am your prototypical like biz dev CEO kind of vibe and it works so well together. But the second thing that I really attribute our success in working together is we've never lived anywhere near each other as adults. So the entire 10 years we've run this business, we've run them a minimum of 700 miles apart from each wow. other. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So you said you're the biz dev C CEO. Yeah, he's the guy who should never talk to a human and <laughs> stay behind the scenes. Not to say every COO should, let me make that clear. But he is great when no one is hanging out with him. That's awesome. <laughs> So, so you think that, that what's really contributed to the success you guys have had is just your difference in per personalities and really kind of contributing to each other's it's, maybe weaknesses? Yeah, or it's the complementary yeah. skill sets that the things that I don't love to do or I'm not as great at, like what I'd call minutia and being in the weeds, he excels at and really enjoys. And vice versa. He doesn't love hanging out with people and selling or doing business development and building relationships. He doesn't love thinking about vision for the company. He just wants to execute. Yeah. So it's really complimentary. That's awesome. And by the way, I mean, I know this is a podcast. So you guys can't see it unless you're looking at, looking at this on social media. Her hat game is just, <laughs> it, it's fire. You're on 10. Thank you. Like I do love a hat. We talked about this. It's a great way to cover up a bad hair day or a, I don't want to put in the effort hair day. Also, I have a really solid hat wall. If you ever come to my house, I'll show you. Yeah. It's pretty sweet. Well, you know what? Not everyone can pull off the hat. Well, thank you. Yeah, and you pull it off for I'll well. take I mean, you're wearing a pretty sweet hat, too, but you, you said know. yours isn't, like, your go-to. I'm not a hat dude, you know, because I don't have a hat head. Like, I look much better with hair. So I've got great hair. It's just... Hiding right I, now. Shout out to my barber. Um, it's been eight days, and so, you know, for me, I gotta, I'm got on a strict six-day haircut regimen. So if I'm wearing a hat... That's probably why. I don't think I could keep up with that. I got no choice. I thought like <laughs> other procedures women had were high maintenance like nails, but damn. Okay. <laughs> the, these, these are black male problems. <laughs> this is are just short-haired human this problems. This is what we do <laughs> every six days. That's the way it goes down. Getting the lineup. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. I've been around. You, you, do, you live in Atlanta. I've lived in Atlanta so, for 17 yeah. years. Yeah, you, you get it. All right, so... You're, tell me a little bit more about the, the development of, of your company because I think that, so I don't know how familiar you are with this, this term. You've listened to, to my podcast, so I'm sure you're familiar with the entrepreneur porn. Right? Yeah. And so I would say that your story on surface is like perfect entrepreneur porn. Totally. It's like, yeah, so I started this business with my brother and how old were you? 25 at 25 and the next thing you know we're kicking ass i got there i'm in 38 states God, i'm I a wish. big boss <laughs> right like yeah. that is entrepreneur porn on totally. surface right like that's how people it's like a weird sentence you're talking about me and my brother and entrepreneur oh, porn. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah uh, i'm here i'm here with you on that <laughs> so so let's have some real talk i want to get into the weeds a little bit and talk about that journey 
As and, she takes a um, sip of drink. Yeah, you better. Hey, this is it's time to drink. This is hold on. Let me get a, get a little sip too. Stuff's about to get real, folks. Mm. <laughs> All right. So, twenty five years old. Mm-hmm. What possessed you to start in the first place? Well, so like if we're going to get really real, really fast, it was because I had three layoffs in three years after I graduated from college. Mm -hmm. And it started when I thought I did the thing that everyone's supposed to do, which was follow my passion into my career. And I started my career in wholesale fashion. And after hitting a three year sales goal in 10 months and realizing not only was like this goal that I was reaching towards not fulfilling, but then I realized I wasn't growing and everyone I was working with was really catty and it was a pretty unhealthy environment. And everything I thought was going to be sexy, like traveling all the time for work, <laughs> actually kind of ruined it for me. Yeah. So I was in this position where I felt kind of lost. And then out of nowhere, I had to get a restraining order against my landlord at the tender age of 23. Mm-hmm. So I, in duress, bought a home very quickly. <laughs> and three months later, I lost my job. And I was terrified Mm -hmm. and I thought, well, this is real life and I'm a grown up now and I have this home that I would rather not foreclose on and I'd rather not run home to Baltimore to live with my parents. And, you know, what am I going to do? And so after two more years of suffering a couple more layoffs as the economy continued to plummet, I thought I'm going to take this into my own hands and do the thing I've always known I wanted to do, which is be an entrepreneur, even though I didn't have that language. I just knew I wanted to have a business. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of dove in and thought, you know, the fable I've been told of go to school, get good grades, get a job happily ever after is not working. So I'm going to take my destiny into my own hands. Did you have an entrepreneur background? Were your parents entrepreneurs? It's interesting. My parents are this perfect combination of what has created me, where my mom was a lifelong entrepreneur, but again, didn't know that word. And unfortunately, the environment I was raised in, we really belittled it. And Hmm. she had a lot of businesses, like you name it, she did it. And even things that weren't businesses, like my mom was a professional equestrian. She was a professional ballroom dancer. She was a bodybuilder in her 40s. What? She had a plus size clothing boutique in the 90s in Philadelphia when she was 5'2 and 100 pounds. Like she has been all over the map. And I was raised to believe that that was failure that she didn't have one trajectory that Uh. made her the best at one thing and it stayed in a straight and narrow path like my dad did, who had been in financial services as an executive for 49 and a half years before he retired about a year and a half ago. And I didn't respect that and I didn't strive to be an entrepreneur because the model I saw was this one that was diminished Mm -hmm. with my mom's work. Wow. So you found yourself an entrepreneur Like, well, well, first of all, let's back up. So you're out of a job. So you, at that point you decided, Hey, look, maybe let me, let's create my own job. Yeah. Like once after three times of being like, Oh, someone paying me and having this quote unquote stability isn't working. Then I was just like, I'm going to do it for myself. I always find that hilarious. Like the stability piece of having a job. Totally. You, You realize your stability is just your next paycheck. Well, and it comes from this, I think, old school thing of people would stay in a job until they got what pensions and they were in it as entire. Right. Exactly. People mentioned pensions. I'm like, that's still a thing. I thought it was a (laughs) relic in antiquity. But that's an old way. It's it's sort of like the fact that I think we are living in this digital age of this connection economy. But historically, we were this industrial economy Mm -hmm. and we're still working under those paradigms. It's the way our education system is set up. It's all these other ways. And I think that paradigm of get a job, it's so stable, was required for that system to work. Mm -hmm. And that system is changing and we're still holding dearly to it, even though it's not working for some of us. I love it. So your decision to be an entrepreneur, let's talk about that a little bit. And, and that, now your company that you started is in payment processing, right? Yes. Okay. What were you, and, and you set out to be in fashion. <laughs> fashion. <laughs> how the hell, did, how did you get there? Walk, walk me down that path. Well, it's funny because I think this is the real hurdle for a lot of entrepreneurs. I think there's a couple ways people fall into entrepreneurship. One is because there's this idea that you can't escape and this perfect plot line per- ensues and you have to chase after this thing. You just can't not do it. And then there's people like me who want to start a business and you have no effing clue what you want to start. Yeah. And there's this weird balance you're trying to create of, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to take the leap, but what's the thing that I'm ready to put all my eggs into the basket of? 
So I was lucky that my brother came to me and said, listen, I'm living in San Diego. I've learned about this payment processing industry. Everyone are basically, sorry, used car salesmen, but the used car salesmen of financial services, I think we can do better. And my first response to him was, how dare you? I was working in all these sexy industries. Like, why would I work in credit card processing? That is horrible. But then I sort of got myself together and put my ego to the side. And I thought, you know what? I actually think that it's the businesses that make other things operate that people don't pay attention to, like the parking garages, the people who put yes. street cones out, like things like that, mm -hmm. that are actually where I should want to put my time, energy, and investment because they're the things that everything else needs to work. It doesn't have to be a trend. It just works. And ironically, this was the end of 2008 when we started having this conversation. So we're in the depth of the recession at this mm -hmm. time. And we're talking about starting a business. And then we're talking about starting one that the only way we make money is if businesses are taking credit card payments and they're all down, which is hilarious. But he came to me and he basically said, here's this opportunity. I see us setting this up as a brokerage. And that has been tried, true, and proven in other financial services arenas. However, it has never been done in merchant services or credit card processing. I have done the due diligence already. I think we should partner up and do this. And he had gotten started at that point in San Diego. And so I flew out, played devil's advocate, learned a lot, came back and said, let me talk to all of my former clients in the fashion world because all of my clients as a wholesaler were retailers. So I had about 90 people that owned retail boutiques and I would reach out to them and just say, what would it take for you to want to switch your merchant account over? And I learned so much through that process. And then many of them became our first clients and we were in business. And then you made $30 million. <laughs> In the story. And then I found right? $5. Yeah. Was that? Was that? Was yeah, that no. I no? mean, I wish it was like that, but unfortunately <laughs> it wasn't. So <laughs> I, whenever I, I talk to other entrepreneurs like or people that, that want to go into entrepreneurship, I try to prepare them for how long it's going to take to reach a, a level to where they can actually maybe start paying themselves. Yep. You know, um, for you, what did that look like? I mean, did you have the immediate entrepreneurial porn success? No. <laughs> so I was in a position where I had had a little bit of savings, but because I wasn't anticipating starting a business and I was coming off of having bought a home and pouring my savings into it because I wasn't preparing to do that at 23 with the restraining, mo restraining order, I had a little bit of savings, but my runway was really small. And so I make no qualms about admitting that I came from a background where my family could help me. Mm -hmm. And that was really important because if they didn't, I wouldn't have been able to go at this and have the success that I have had now. So I took a loan from my mom that ended up being six figures. And it wasn't even for the business. It was for me to survive. And one of the proudest moments I've ever had was paying that loan back. Mm. And it was really interesting because we talked about the dynamic of working with family. The dynamic of your family having a loan over your head is a whole other Oh my thing. God, I can only imagine. Because while they were in Baltimore and I was in Atlanta and we weren't seeing each other day to day, I remember every time we'd get on the phone to talk, I had this looming guilt of, well, what if I tell them I went out to dinner with my friends? Are they going to feel like I'm squandering that money? What if I told mm. them that I went to the gym today? They're going to know I have a gym membership. They're going to think that's a waste. Like everything felt guilty. And it was a really hard place to be. And so, you know, I, I say that to just be really candid that I was really lucky to have that opportunity and to have a family who could do it and who believed in me enough to help. But it also wasn't just like, hey, here's your money. Go off and do something with it. It, it, it carried some strings. Well, you know, I think that, you know, what I pull from that there is that I think sometimes we're afraid to go to our family. We're afraid to go to our loved ones to help support us and to help us to reach those dreams, right? So I, what I like about your story is that you did, and you were successful, which which helps. <laughs> it would have sucked if you weren't able to pay that loan <laughs> yeah, back. Yeah, that would suck. <laughs> but, you know, when we talk about entrepreneur porn, there's this notion out there that, like, everything is, I just strapped, strapped my boots up and I did everything on my own. We don't do everything on our own. It doesn't work that way. Whether it's financial support, whether it's the mental support, emotional mm -hmm. support, whatever it is, we need a team. We right. need folks that, that have our back to support us. And or whether it's your network who's helping open doors for you or coach you or yes. cheer you on or make an introduction or whatever the thing is. Like you said, you don't go at this alone. And if you do, you're making it exponentially harder for absolutely no reason. Anyone that says they did it all by themselves is a damn lie. Also, I wouldn't trust that person. Man, like, don't. What? Yes. Why? <laughs> yes. Don't trust them. Okay. 
You know one thing that's a fun question we didn't get into now, and I see you're over there enjoying your Prosecco while they're breaking dishes in the kitchen behind us. (laughs) What's your favorite spirit? Well, today it's Prosecco, but T- otherwise today. it's probably at Moscow Mule. And I've got to give credit to Oprah because she totally introduced the world to this. Did you know this, that she and Gail went on this like epic road trip, camping trip on air years ago? And she was making Moscow Mules and teaching all of their camp neighbors how to make them. And suddenly they blasted off and now they're on every menu. So, Obviously the Oprah effect. <laughs> so, Dara, do I look like the guy that knows everything that Oprah does? I hope so. <laughs> 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 okay, so I well, love. I sure do. No, I love. I love Auntie Oprah. Who doesn't love Auntie Oprah? Those are also the people I don't trust. Those I, who don't. I agree. <laughs> like, what's not? What's not to like? But yes, those are the haters who I, are just I, looking for someone to hate on. I have <laughs> tremendous respect. I love what she does, and um, yeah, but I don't. I don't watch Own. I'm sorry. My mom's been on there a ton, though. Your mom's been on Own a lot. Yeah, she's an actress. Oh, hey, mama. Yeah, so she's done some different stuff and. Done some shows on OWN. and th- cool. Doesn't Oprah have another network? Not that I know of. Oh, I don't know. She's got her podcast, though. Does she? Is that killing it? You guys it? are going toe-to-toe. No. <laughs> yeah, she, Super Soul Session. She, <laughs> no, she's behind me. I'm, <laughs> <we're>, <laughs> she's ranked 21. Oprah, He's top 20. <laughs> Oprah, holler at me. Come on, give, give me a call, yeah, and I, I can help boost. put you on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... You know, we talk about some heavy stuff, um, and, and, and we'll get back into a little bit of heavy stuff. You're going to give me respite like for a second? Light stuff. Now, I'm going <laughs> to toss you a softball real quick. Okay. Favorite hip-hop artist, because I'm a hip-hop head. Who's your favorite hip-hop, hip-hop Lauren artist? Lauren Hill, only album, Miseducation of Lauren Hill. Also love Fuji's. Also just saw her recently-ish at the Hollywood Bowl when she was doing her tour for the 20th anniversary. Damn. How are you so popular off of one album, though? I'm just saying. It's incredible. She's like the coolest. One Hit Wonder is wrong because it's not one hit, but like taking a one album into the stratosphere. So Fuji's fan as, as well. Totally. You have a favorite song? Fuji La. Ooh la la la. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sing it. We were singing songs before we got on we air. We were and singing. Just keep going. Yeah, before we got on air, what were we singing? We were singing a song from the one and only Billy Madison yes. starring Adam Sandler circa, what, 1991? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> that it's one the maybe. the suntan lotion song. Yeah. It's good that movie. or the school bus song and snack packs. Yeah, oh my gosh. Yeah. Just give me my snack pack. I thought pack. I was your snack pack. <laughs> <laughs> if people are older than, are no, younger than us, we not just lost pay. half the audience. Yeah, exactly. right now. <laughs> like, Any Gen Zers, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll bring them back. Bring them back. All right. So this question now will go to those younger folks that didn't understand what we were talking about with Billy Madison and Lauren Hill and all that stuff. Let's go back in time. 25 year old. Okay, you're 25. No, before that, you're 23, before you even started on your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. Advice, what would you tell yourself? What are you telling that those Gen Z, those borderline millennials right now, what advice would you give yourself that you'd give to them today? There's so much advice I would have given myself. I think the first thing was to understand that no one's paying as much attention as you think that they are, and that's oh. actually freeing. That a fear that I had, and I recognize a lot of other people share with me as well, is that they're so afraid of failing publicly. They're so afraid of what people are gonna think if something doesn't go the way that they hope it will. But the thing that I came to learn is everyone is so heads down into their own stuff that they're not paying that much attention. And those who are really want you to succeed. So just go. And that failure isn't actually the thing to be afraid of. The not moving, the not trying, the not expressing what you have to share with this world is the thing that you might actually regret. So just start moving. That's how momentum develops. And then also, too, I think I had this misconception, sort of speaking of like the Oprah effect or the American idolization of things, that there was going to be this pinnacle moment, that there was this like knight on a white horse that was going to ride in and be the one that would make everything pop and make everything work. And that unless I had the celebrity endorsement or unless I had Oprah's favorites things list or unless I had fill in the blank, it was never going to happen, and I needed to wait around for that person to help save me. And I came to realize that you are your own savior. Don't mean that religiously. And that you have to be your own biggest cheerleader and advocate because no one's going to do that for you. But people will rally around you when you do it for yourself. Oh, I love that. Excellent. So my next question, we touched on fear a little bit. What scares you 
Well, it's the thing that I said. It's it's not expressing my gifts fully. So when I look, I like to do deathbed exercises and I recommend people do them. And it sounds a, a deathbed exercise and it sounds really grotesque and kind of cryptic. But what it means is think about writing your eulogy or think about if you have a deathbed and let's hope that it's when you're really old and you've lived a lot of life that you're looking back and what do you want to be able to say about your life? And really that means like, what are your values and how do things align? And when I think about that, I think, well, who did I spend time with? What kind of a legacy can I leave? What gifts do I have that are things that I want to help other people or solve problems in this world around? And the thing that I'm afraid of is getting lazy or not utilizing them to their full degree, which means if I don't do that, that I'm hurting other people because I didn't utilize myself on their behalf. So what does that fear motivate you to do? Because I, I find that fear is the strongest motivator. Right? It can so. be, or it can be the thing that really stops you in your tracks if you allow it to consume you. Same thing. Same yeah, thing, Yeah, you're right. right? You're right. Yeah. You're right. That is a motivation. Fair. So, so what does it motivate, that fear that you have, what does it motivate you to do? What are you doing about it? To be the person with that laundry list of shit that we talked about at the beginning who's constantly moving. So actually, like, to anything, there's a counterpoint. There's a polarity to everything. So it could motivate me to just be racking up the list of stuff and the accomplishments. And for the first maybe eight years of my entrepreneurial career, that's exactly what I did. But now I've hit a point where I've realized I have to stop and define success for myself. And it is not about the accolades. It is not about the dollars in the bank. It's about, for me, learning, being a lifelong learner. It's about being in deep relationship. It's about being known. It's about seeing other people. It's about teaching, sharing, helping other people grow. And so it motivates me to do that at a bigger level and not allow the inner critics in my head telling me, you're not good enough, you can't do that, someone's already been doing that, whatever those are, to keep going and being like, this is more important than those voices. I love that because, you know, that's one of the things that I talk about a lot. And I think when you, when you talk to people that have been successful, that have balance, um, you'll find that all of those material things, they just, they're, I, don't, I won't say that, yeah, they're fun, but it, it was, it's empty when you're looking at what real success means, right? Because you can never have enough cars, you can never have enough houses, you can never have enough money in the bank. And, and those, that money just, it starts to become ones and zeros anyway. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've transacted so much money. It just, it, it loses its, it, you just don't feel anything. Totally. You know? Money is a tool and it's a tool for however you want to use it. Mm -hmm. And I have always seen, and this is because I started reading Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad works in high school, that money is a tool for financial freedom. And what do you want to do with the freedom? For me, I wanted to have freedom of time so I could choose how I spent it to do the type of stuff that I'm doing today. And that's really all that it is. But when you give so much power to money just as an object in and of itself, then you're really falling prey to the when effect of when X happens, I'll be happy or I'll be fulfilled. And every time we get to quote unquote when, we realize when wasn't real, it was an illusion. Mm -hmm. And then we keep chasing. So I'm going to name drop for a second, but Deepak Chopra and I have a video series every week. Name drop. And one of the things that he has helped me understand is that if you can't be happy now, you will never be happy regardless of your circumstances. Okay, you just dropped like the major name drop there, Deepak. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that a little bit because um, I found now for those of you that listen to the podcast regularly or or watch my my um, business and bourbon web series or content, you know that I I am the I have the largest library of partially read books that you're going to find. <laughs> um, I just I I not love books. I just, <laughs> Not when it comes to the books, I'm not. <laughs> so, um, Deepak, I, I've got multiple books, right? And I, and I often talk about some of those principles because I, a lot of it resonates with me. So that's He has a, 89 books, about to have 90, so it wouldn't surprise me if you haven't Jesus finished all his books. Jesus Christ, and doesn't sound like I ever will. This is his last, so you got time. Says 90 who? is the cap. Is this last like a... No, it's seriously his last. Is it last like a boxer though? Because boxers, yeah. oh, this coming is my out of retirement and being like, oh, fight. actually, I'm going to play baseball now. <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to talk about that. So, I, I noticed you've done some stuff. You've done some things with with Deepak. Talk about that. Well, I think it's important to maybe talk about the how it came to be because okay. it's an important lesson. At least I think so. So last year, I made the intention to start putting a lot of my energies into the work that I was talking about of helping people design their lives, build businesses to fund it and networks to support it. And I decided that my coming out party, so to speak, was going to be a virtual conference. So an online summit 
that was going to teach all of the things that I had learned through all of my peers and mentors that had helped me along the way, whether or not they knew it, <laughs> and that it was going to be entirely free, free day, three day thing. And that Deepak was one of the primary people that I wanted to headline it. I didn't know Deepak. Through the way that networks in the universe works, I was able to connect with his publicist. And his publicist was really interested, but in the way publicists work, they kept saying, well, who else is doing it? Uh -huh. Them wanting a couple other big names. And I had Tony Robbins potentially doing it. I had a bunch of big names potentially doing it, but no one had locked in. Everyone kept asking for who else is doing it, who else is doing it. So at that point, I realized, you know what? I'm going to lean on my network. And years before that, I was at a conference, and I made friends with a woman, and we became great friends. And I later learned that she used to be Deepak's COO. And so I called her, and I said, listen, Rebecca, I know that this is a really important relationship to you. And if you don't feel comfortable, I totally understand. But here's where I am. If you could say anything that might help him know that you know me and that this is legit, I'd really appreciate it. So she ends up sending me a screenshot of her text to him. And three hours later, he said yes. And a couple of days later, I flew to New York to interview him. So in my mind, I thought, wow, this was a once in a lifetime experience. And that will truly be what it was. And he gave me his contact information because we wrote a Forbes article about it after. And I thought, you know, that was lovely. I will always cherish that. But then as serendipity would have it, I was hired by Chase Bank later that summer, about three months later, to be their on-site correspondent at their um, Atlanta conference. And I got to interview he and Cam Newton. So there I am in the green room and Cam Newton's fanboying over Deepak. And Deepak- Was he really? Totally. It was so <laughs> cute. And I'm sitting there like calming him down, being like, oh, don't worry. Deepak's so cool. I interviewed him. It's all good. And Deepak's being so friendly and so lovely. And then as time went on, I ended up interviewing him twice more in 2018. And after, the last time was early mid-December. After Christmas, I had this thought, and this is one of the cues here is, follow your intuition. And I thought, you know what, I need to reach back out to all the high profile people who I worked with in the past year. I had worked with him and Adam Grant and some NBA players and Shaquille O'Neal and Jillian Michaels and like all of these incredible people. And I thought, let me just reach out to them and let them know that I am here in their court if they need anything in 2019 and I'm here to support them. And that's the other piece. I wasn't ever coming at these relationships from a what can I get from you is how can I add value? And that is always number one. And it's always about long game, never about short term transactions in my book. So I reached out to him and 15 minutes later on December 26, 2018, he sends me this email back and he said, you know what, I was reflecting too and I think you can help me. And he wasn't clear on how, but he basically said, my message is super esoteric and I know people sometimes have a hard time understanding it. I think you can help me. And I said, how? And within 15 minutes, we had ping pong emails back and forth and decided that we were gonna start this video series that would make the deep relatable and translatable in a relatively short amount of time for our listeners. And two weeks later, it was launched. And now we spend all this time together and I get to learn front row from him and with him. And I call him a friend at this point and he's been incredible. But none of it would have happened if I hadn't have been available, if I hadn't have built a network before I needed it, if I hadn't have been coming from this generosity lens and I hadn't followed my instincts and said yes when opportunity presented itself. Wow, let's back that down for the audience out there. So there's someone that's listening to you right now that can do some amazing stuff, right? They just don't know it yet. Yeah, like, I had no clue. Yeah. Well, man, did you think in 2017 that you're like, oh, I'm going to be kicking with Deepak. Me and Deepak. I'm no. No. So let's reiterate that. What did you do? Because I'm, I'm an action guy. I'm all about action. I don't believe that. I don't believe in things. And certain people, they don't like when I say this, but I don't care. And it's my show. <laughs> <laughs> the, things just happen for a reason. Now, I... I, I for me, um, we, we make decisions, and some of those decisions are seemingly insignificant until they aren't, Yeah. right? Um, so there's someone right now that's teetering. They Maybe they got some big dreams, they got some, some, but they haven't put any action to it. What do you tell them from your experience? What, what should they do? Well, to your point, your thoughts become your actions. So if you think you can't do it, you already can't do it. So for me, I think the distinction was, I didn't think in 2017 that this was gonna happen with Deepak because I wasn't even there yet. But once it got to the point of, okay, I'm speaking it into existence of, I'm going to have this virtual summit, and it ended up having 45 people, but I said, it's gonna have these high profile speakers and they're going to be of service to this audience. Then it was a matter of me saying, I'm good enough and I believe in myself enough that if I get this opportunity that I'm not going to squander it and I'm not going to screw it up because I think that was the only thing that was preventing me from doing it in the first place. And then it was really, like I said, sort of digging the well before I was thirsty. And 
building relationships before I needed them. And it wasn't because I was strategically thinking, oh, one day I'm going to get to Deepak. That wasn't it at all. Actually, the person I've always wanted to get to because I admire her so much is the Queen Oprah. And so now I'm one degree of separation. So like we're getting there. But it wasn't because I was strategically thinking, how do I get to Oprah? How do I get to Deepak? It wasn't that. It was just every small step I had was moving me in that direction. So for someone who's looking at this and thinking, my big goal is X, start doing the work now in whatever framework. Like you and I are sitting here and I'm thinking, this happened because I put an intention out and put it publicly. I put it on all of my social media and I said, I love being on podcasts. I've been having a blast doing this with Deepak. I want to do 30 in 30 days. Who can you introduce me to? And the floodgates opened. And it's that exact thing that it doesn't have to start with Deepak. It doesn't have to start with Oprah, but start where you are and then let the momentum build. And now you're done. I mean, <laughs> now I can we, you, did, you did the <laughs> podcast. Um, everything else is just eh, exactly it's downhill I mean, from there. I mean, look, once you're on this one, just like mic drop. We're, 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 we're literally we're sitting here. We're having drinks. We're waxing poetic, having a great time. It's beautiful it's outside. This is, this is Does it get any better meter. than this? It doesn't. Oh, my God. So, <laughs> so, so then you're officially done, right? Well, you're, re you're retiring for, right now. Except for the 29 others that I already booked. <laughs> And then I'm finished. <laughs> oh, I thought I was going to retire. I'm just you. a believer in commitment, you know, follow through. <laughs> All right. Just, don't, don't just, take, just mail it in don't, a little bit. Don't take that one you, personally. You, yeah, you totally. I'm, I'm going to give them the 99%. You're getting the 100. Yes, mm -hmm. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what does someone that's... Uh, b before I go here, though, I, there's one more question I have about your journey in, in business. Because we talked about how it started, and then you scaled this thing up to you're in, what, 38, 38 states? states? Jesus. Um, okay. So I get a lot of questions from entrepreneurs about scaling. Because, you know, until you've built a scalable business, it is a job. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> so that's what I like to say. You're, you're really a business when you can scale and you can multiply yourself and you can, and, and when, when you're not there every day, things still work. Yeah. Um, so I know this spans several years, yeah. but let's speak to that. Let's give a little advice to, to s some entrepreneurs out there that are maybe one man shops, two man shop, three man shop. And want to scale like what did you do what did you do and what do you what do you recommend that people do if they want to scale their business so interestingly i don't like big businesses for myself and i don't believe that bigger is always better and i've learned that through trial and error and through paying attention and watching other people so with the business and credit card processing to grow to 38 states it was honestly just a slow progression and moving slowly but surely and getting comfortable with delegating and handing things off and knowing that if I felt it was A plus from me that it could be A minus or B plus from someone else and that that was okay and becoming comfortable with that because I was a controller. I was like, if it can't be an A plus, it can't happen. I got to own it. But that was such a bottleneck and it was useless. The other part was too that we created a really intentionally lean business where as a brokerage, we don't own any of the actual infrastructure. So everything gets outsourced ultimately, which has its own challenges. Like there were multiple times that we had what is basically the equivalent of embezzlements from the companies that we outsource things to where they just stole our entire book of business. This happened twice. And we went back to zero in an instant when I thought everything was good and dandy. So there's that. There's also the challenge that when you broker or you hand off, you don't get full control over the outcome. It's like drop shipping or something like that. It looks a lot of different ways in different yeah. business models. So you have to be fully aware of what you can control and what you cannot and what promises you're making and how you develop those relationships with your clients and how you position who you are in that role. But on the flip side, we could have never grown the way that we did for at least what our resources were if it weren't for building it so leanly and handing it off and developing teams and infrastructures that we didn't ultimately own and it was all brokered out. And then same thing with Network Under 40, when I developed that into other cities, I had to learn a method to teach other people everything that was in my brain and entrust them with some amount of framework and guardrails and boundaries to run it in their market and basically ran it like a franchise model. So you just dropped one other thing that you do. Let's talk about that, the Network Under 40. What is that? Okay. So Network Under 40 is a networking events company. We put on networking events once to twice a month in mid-tier U.S. cities to help people build real, authentic, organic relationships, friendship first, business second. Are you checking IDs? Just <laughs> it's hilarious. We don't. 
<laughs> Although I will say our whole real goal is just to make it peer to peer. And every once in a while, there's someone that's like a 65 year old dude who's there to hit on women. And yes. I will check him. I'll be honest. I'll be that guy. You're not 65. No, I mean when I'm 65. Great. No, I'm <laughs> you're like, that's my goal. That's <laughs> what you're striving towards. <laughs> I'm going to be into the under 40 events hitting on the chicks. But as a whole, we really care. Like, are you peer based? Do you feel like these are the people that you're in the same stage of life with? And that's really the most important part. I like it. So you said mid-tier cities. Mm -hmm. And why did you choose mid-tier cities? And this business lesson, guys. Well, it's I call it sort of the up-leveled Walmart model, where Walmart would go to the places where no one was, these tiny towns that people were ignoring and sleeping on. And I saw it as, well, one, I live in Atlanta, which I think is at that cusp, but it's I think it's mid-tier, top 10, but bottom of the top 10. Come on, man. No, it's not a hating thing on the city. I think it's actually an advantage. But when I look at cities, like I travel about 60% of the time, and I spend a lot of my time in cities like Chicago and San Francisco and L.A. and New York. And when I'm in those places, I realize there's so much going on that it's almost like overflow and overwhelm for people. Whereas in Atlanta, there's still so much going on, but there really wasn't a place where you could find people so naturally and organically. And people are moving to these mid-tier cities in troves. Like we're in Nashville, 90 people are moving to Nashville every single day and many of them are millennials. So when you're coming to a city and you're trying to plug in and connect with people and get to meet friends as well, there's not a place for that. So I thought, where is there a real market opportunity and where is there not as much competition? So I picked mid-tier. Nice. And again, business lesson, guys. Like I think that a lot of times we look at the fancy, shiny object mm -hmm. out there and, and think that that's where the money is. Um, we had Abby Golhar on one of our shows as well, and we talked about, Abby and I talked about where to invest, right? And um, similar advice, mid-tier cities, uh, what is it, tertiary markets. That's a tertiary <laughs> fancy markets. Fancy investor yes. terms. Fancy lad. That's what I call Abby. <laughs> Shout out, Abby. What's up? <laughs> hey, Abby. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we don't look, there, there's money all over the place. Right. And yeah. there's a market for your service, whatever it may be, in a place that you probably don't you're not thinking about right now. Everyone looks to where the big like we're here in Buckhead, the heart of Atlanta. And this is the heart of commerce. Right. And so we look and we see all this this money around us. But you know what? It's plenty of money being spent 20 miles north. 30 miles south, right? So I think that's a lesson for all of us. If, if you're out there, you're an entrepreneur, and you're thinking about, hey, where you're, where to, to, to focus on selling your product, selling your service, think about underserved areas, right? Right, or think about growing where you're planted. So I was in a city that I understood, and I was creating something for a market that I understood because I was one of them with the same problem. And not to say you can't create a successful business for someone that's not your market. You had a but problem meeting people? I had a problem. I don't think so. Well, okay, that's fair. But I did have a problem finding my people, you know, like finding my specific people? tribe, people who are lifelong learners, who are not just going to like go to work, you're quick, go I make dinner, watch TV all night and go to bed on repeat and then live for the weekends to get wasted and start over and like no shame on them. But like I wanted people who were going after something that were constantly improving themselves, who were looking at the world from a lens of curiosity and you don't find those necessarily everywhere. And so creating a place where that could be the vibe and the culture where people were open and they were open-minded like that was really important to me love it okay so we're about to close but before we do what does the hard-working ceo with i don't know you've got like 12 titles i looked at your it's, it just keeps <laughs> chief going chief curiosity around. officer yeah, is my favorite <laughs> chief curiosity <laughs> that's a new one what do you do what do you do for fun travel softball yeah, yeah, definitely travel. So I mentioned that I travel about 60% of the time. My partner and I have designed our life in that way where we both work for ourselves. And he and I like to just kind of like put our finger on the map and be like, let's go. And we work from wherever we are. We get to dive in with our friends in different places. We get to explore. And that for me is great. I always feel inspired. I always feel more creative. I always feel energized when I do that and then come back home feeling really hyped to keep going. That's what's up. All right. With that said... I want to thank you so much for joining the pod. Was that fun? That was lots of fun. Was it good? Thank All you. All right, so I'm going to let you, because we had so much fun. There's one thing that we say when we close out every single podcast, and I'm going to let you do it. Oh. And it is, you say, we out. Okay, can you do that was for Was it we out? It's we out. Oh, I can and, do oh, that. Oh, I gotta got to say it like kind of cool, though. Yeah, you got to like cool like a DJ, MC, okay? This is the most stressful part of the whole podcast. It is, because you weren't expecting that. <laughs> I wasn't. You got it? Okay, ready? All right, it's on you.
We out. Thank you for listening to the Business and Bourbon podcast. Please subscribe. And if you like us, give us a five-star rating. If you don't, uh, have another drink. Maybe you'll feel a little bit differently. If you'd like to check out our videos, you can go to businessandbourbon.tv. That's businessandbourbon.tv. In addition to that, we're currently touring the United States with our Business and Bourbon Live show. It's a fantastic show where we do a whiskey education and we do some Q&A and it's a great network. So if you'd like to attend one of our Business and Bourbon Live events, you can go to businessandbourbon.live. Again, that's businessandbourbon.live. Thanks again for listening.